In the previous video, we looked at GFR and saw how it GFR was too high. That could end up causing excretion of too many electrolytes and too much water. Or if GFR was too low, that means we'd end up reabsorbing maybe some of the waste that we don't want to um, reabsorb. So we need to make sure GFR is just right, that Goldilocks principle of not too high, not too low, just be just right. So this video is going to concentrate on how we do that. How do we regulate GFR to keep it within a normal value? So that's going to be intrinsic controls and extrinsic controls to do that. And sometimes these controls are in conflict with each other, and we'll look at some of those as well. So let's first think about how we regulate GFR in general. It's really all about controlling blood pressure in the glomerulus. Remember, net filtration pressure is primarily determined by the blood pressure, the hydrostatic pressure of the blood in the glomerulus. And, if, and that's going to affect NFP, and NFP then affects GFR. So if I can regulate the blood pressure in the glomerulus, then I'm going to be able to regulate GFR. And to do that, I've got intrinsic controls and extrinsic controls. Now the intrinsic controls are the autoregulation things. These are what the kidneys taking care of themselves. That is, I'm not using neural or hormonal input. I'm just going to do uh, stuff in the kidney itself to help fine tune that GFR and keep it in normal levels. The extrinsic controls are going to be the hormones and the sympathetic control. But the goal of extrinsic controls is more to control systemic blood pressure, not to control GFR. Sometimes it works that way that by controlling systemic blood pressure, I also get GFR back to normal levels. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. So let's first look at the intrinsic controls of GFR. One is the myogenic mechanisms. Now myo means muscle. So think of this related to the fact that vascular smooth muscles will contract when they're stretched. So in other words, if I cause a smooth muscle to stretch, it's going to constrict. So you can imagine if I have too high a blood pressure, that blood is going to push into the afferent arterial and push against the walls, causing the smooth muscle in the walls of the afferent arterial to be stretched. In response to that, they constrict. That's going to reduce blood flow into the glomerulus, and that means lower blood pressure in the glomerulus, which then would be restoring blood pressure back to normal and keeping GFR at normal. So we can see that in the next slide. Here, the girl is sort of exercising. She's doing toe rises, but OK, fine. Um, but anyway, so her pressure is up at 140. If her blood pressure stayed high, that means we'd have a higher blood pressure in the glomerulus here, and that would up NFP and up GFR, and we don't want that. So the afferent arterial responds by constricting. Um, that is, that stretch, because of the higher blood pressure, causes those smooth muscles to constrict. Now the blood flow between the afferent and efferent is more consistent, so I've reduced blood flow, more getting out or comparison, and so that means lower blood pressure in here, lower NFP, and that means lower GFR. Or you can look at it in the other extreme, let's say blood pressure goes down, like here she's resting, so her blood pressure drops to 100, and so now in response to less stretch, the AFR arterials will dilate. Now I got a bigger difference in the sizes between the two, and so that means more blood flow into the glomerulus. That means a higher blood pressure here, which means then a higher NFP and a higher GFR. The other mechanism to control GFR is called the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, and this has to do with the macula densa cells that's part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So first let's think in this term, so let's say we have a high GFR, so there's high blood pressure, and that means high NFP, high GFR. Now if I have a high GFR, that means I'm making lots of filtrate in a short period of time, so that filtrate's got to be rushing through the tubules of the kidney quite fast. So 
that means there's not enough time to reabsorb all of the material that's flying through those tubules. It's just going by too fast. So there's less reabsorption. And so if that means if there's less reabsorption, we have a higher sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate than we would normally. Well, the macula densa senses this high sodium chloride concentration and they secrete a paracrine, but that's not unidentified. It's actually ATP. ATP is a vasoconstrictor. So macula densa cells um, secrete ATP. That ATP acts as a vasoconstrictor on the afferent arterioles. So now the afferent arterioles constrict. That means re now that means reduced blood flow into the glomerulus, which means less blood pressure, lower NFP, and a reduced GFR back to normal levels. And this can work in the opposite direction as well. If I had low GFR, then that's going to mean really slow movement of filtrates through the renal tubules, which means lots of reabsorption, and that in turn then if I've got lots of reabsorption I have very little sodium chloride in that filtrate the macula densa can sense that release less ATP which means less constriction so we have more dilation afferent arterioles dilate instead that's going to increase blood pressure in the glomerulus increasing NFP and then increasing GFR back to normal levels so it works in both directions to help regulate um, GFR and keep it within those normal values. Now extrinsic control of GFR is again the purpose is to control systemic blood pressure even if it has a negative effect on a kidney. So here's an example where that could happen. Let's say you have a decrease in blood pressure because of shock. In response to that you're going to have secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine and they're going to bind to alpha adrenergic receptors. Those alpha adrenergic receptors are going to cause constriction and in the afferent arterioles. That means constriction of the afferent arterioles. That means lower blood flow into the glomerulus which is going to lower blood pressure, lowering NFP, lowering GFR in urine production. That way then we're not making so much urine. We're just going to basically not even bother with that um, so that we can make ensure that the blood volume stays as high as it can. We just definitely just don't want to make urine if we're bleeding out or we have really low blood pressure and shock. So we're lowering GFR to the point that the kidneys could begin to um, shut down and go into acute renal failure. But the fallen blood pressure will also then, I mean, in response to that, I should say those local controls are going to want to try to up GFR, but a fall in blood pressure can actually override that. And the sympathetic nervous system is basically going to override the local controls to ensure that the blood gets diverted elsewhere, particularly our brain and um, our heart, and therefore restoring systemic blood pressure at the cost of the kidneys. Now, other extrinsic controls can also be in play, and they're gonna, they can actually work with um, restoring GFR, and that's the renin-angiotensin II mechanism. Now, in this case, um, we have a lot of different ways or, or triggers to release renin. We've done this one already when we looked at regulating blood pressure. So you know renin is gonna produce angiotensin I, and that in turn is gonna, and then it's going to get converted to angiotensin II, and then that has all kinds of things, uh, regulating things to uh, up blood pressure. So how do we get renin secreted? Well, there's three different ways to trigger the release of renin from the kidneys. Um, one is a decrease in blood pressure itself. That's going to be signal or a reduced stretch on those granular cells. Now the granular cells, remember, are part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. They are surrounding the afferent arterial. So if blood pressure is low, they're not going to be stretched as much, and that is going to cause them to release renin. Then there could be stimulation of granular cells through the macula densa cells. If blood pressure is low, as we looked at the tubuloglomerular um, mechanisms, then low GFR means low sodium chloride concentration because the filtrate's moving so slowly. That's going to trigger the macula densa, 
uh, to tell the granular cells to release renin. And then sympathetic input is going to also cause a release of renin because the baroreceptor reflexes, that is the sensing of this low blood pressure, sympathetic stimulation directly on the granular cells uh, by binding to adrenergic receptors, uh, that would trigger the release of renin. Once renin is released, we get all of these things happening. We saw this again when we did blood pressure regulation, so I'm not going to go through two through six, and the plus they are described here on the next slide for you. So look those over again. That's part of blood pressure regulation with aldosterone, vasoconstriction, ADH types of things going on. This one, though, is new. This one I added um, simply because it's, it's only related to the kidney functioning. Again, it's going to affect blood pressure, but it does it by constricting the efferent arterial. Now, if I constrict the efferent arterial, and if the efferent arterial is still wide open, that means then that we're going to have a buildup of blood flow in the glomerulus. That's upping blood pressure, upping NFP, increasing GFR, which is good for the kidneys. But what I want to look at is downstream from that. The efferent arterial connects to the peritubular capillaries. Now, if blood flow to the peritubular capillaries decreases, that means blood pressure in those peritubular capillaries decreases. Now, if you remember back to your capillary dynamics, where we have a balance between filtration and reabsorption along the length of the capillaries. If you remember the arterial end, you have filtration. At the venous end, you have reabsorption. Well, if I drop blood pressure, that means I'm going to have less filtration and more reabsorption, meaning I return more fluids back to the blood. So it's one of those autotransfusion types of mechanisms that we saw when we did capillary dynamics. We're simply restoring blood flow or blood volume um, by constricting that efferent arterial, causing more reabsorption at the venual end of that peritubular capillary. In this slide, we're simply looking at the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it, a different way of flowing. Um, and so it, it's not, no new information on this slide, but it might be something that's easier for you to see it looking at it this way. Again, the idea is to decrease, say, blood flow to the kidneys. Um, causes a decrease in GFR, so that means the juxtaglomerular apparatuses, the granular cells release renin, that means angiotensin II, and then here's all the things angiotensin II does. Here's that efferent arterials we saw, number one on the slide before, um, and that means we're going to up GFR back, or up blood pressure, which would up GFR in the long run. Um, here's aldosterone, means more sodium and water reabsorption, more blood. Here's ADH, stimulation of the central nervous system to increase thirst. More fluids, more water reabsorbed, that's all going to up blood volume. Here's the cardiac output and vasoconstrictor part to up blood pressure. If I up systemic blood pressure, that means my net filtration pressure is going to come back to normal, my GFR is going to come back to normal, and kidneys are working great again. And this is another summary slide, kind of looking at the intrinsic and extrinsic control. So here's the autoregulation stuff. We looked here with a decrease in GFR, means dilation of the afferent arterials because of less stretch. Uh, we look at constriction of the afferent arterials can happen too, um, in that, and then constriction of the mesangeal cells we never looked at, but this is the idea of reducing surface tension that ups the blood pressure in the glomerulus. That means higher NFP, which means normal GFR, or back to normal GFR and back to homeostasis. Sometimes that blood pressure doesn't get high enough, so now we have to turn to the other mechanisms, primarily through angiotensin II mechanisms. So here is the, a repeat, basically, of all the angiotensin II mechanisms that are in play. So you'll want to run through those and get used to that. So that looks at our regulation of GFR. We're going to move on to the next video to tubular reabsorption.